Hello and welcome to this special edition of EC3 HOSA Medical Moments. For the last number of weeks since April, we've been bringing in individuals with the Lincoln Trail District Health Department to discuss its role and the many things going on since COVID-19 has taken over the world. <laughs> Joining me today is Melissa Phillips, and Melissa is uh, doing dual heads. She, she does numerous things at um, the Lincoln Trail District Health Department, but uh, she's also become a public information officer for that uh, department too. Melissa, first tell us, where are we at right now? What's the current situation in the counties that you serve? Mm -hmm. And in terms of number of cases that occurred, how many are still presently being treated and hospitalized, and then any death totals that you may have? I brought the state numbers for comparison as well. Mm -hmm. So as a state, Kentucky has 7,688 positive cases, and we have experienced 334 deaths as a state. So when we look at our six-county district, we have had 147 positives. Um, unfortunately, we have had four deaths, two in Hardin and two in Meade. But the positive side of that is 137 of our, out of our 147 are either at home recovering or they've been released from monitoring. Okay. That, and honestly, I think that when this first happened, we thought those numbers would be a lot higher. So it's a positive that, that they've stayed low. And just to tell us, why do you think that's the case? <laughs> I think um, our residents took all the healthy at home measures to heart. I think they have been staying home as they should. I think they've been wearing their masks. Now we know things are probably going to change a little bit now that we're having the healthy at work um, reopenings. Um, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit. Right. Now has the role of the department changed, your department changed in this regard? Have you all started switching up some things? Um, we actually are cross-training some of our staff to be case, case investigators because we do anticipate those numbers are going to go up. You know, um, as more people return to work, churches are starting to open, we're looking at restaurants opening at partial capacity, um, we know those positives are going to increase, pos you know, possibly substantially. So we want to be prepared for that. And what, what's the job of the case manager? Or the, case uh, the case investigators, anytime we get a positive um, from a lab, they make contact with that person, you know, find out their status. Are they able to recover at home? Have they been hospitalized? Um, if they've been hospitalized, what kind of care have they needed? But they also have to find a, um, their immediate contacts because we need to know who has been exposed in their home, possibly their workplace. Mm -hmm. And um, I know of the two deaths in Hardin County, and I just know this from what's been uh, reported in the News Enterprise, mm -hmm. they've done lengthy stories on the two individuals that had passed away, and also the one lady from Meade County. Um, it, I think in all three of those cases, it's really unknown where it originated, but there's, I guess, opinions. Sometimes we don't ever find out where they were exposed. And, you know, that is true. Okay. And is that just because there's just too much contact? You know, the individuals have been in too much contact with, with multiple situations? Um, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes there's such a lag. By the time we find out that they were positive, we don't know what their history was in that time period. You know, it can take from 24 hours up to two weeks before we get a confirmed lab test. So if they have waited a week, two weeks, um, because they haven't had symptoms, you know, that's weeks now that they've had to think back, where have I been and who have I been in contact with? Yeah. Um, with, with, let's talk about the things opening mm -hmm. and that rollout. How do you all approach that? Um, and first off, let's just talk about the rollout initially and where we're moving. When you want to keep track of what's opening when, 
the very best place you can go is the state website's Healthy at Work tab. And that's at kycovid19.ky.gov. Because if you've paid any attention, you know that the timeline has been changing. So what we think we know changes sometimes twice a week. Things have moved up and down in the timeline. Mm -hmm. um, I t think I told you earlier, I printed it off this morning just so I was sure, and some things have been added. So that's the best place to go to get the most current information. So what opened on May 11th was construction, horse racing without fans in the stands, manufacturing, distribution, offices can come back at half capacity, um, pet grooming services, photography, and then vehicle dealerships. And then, let's see, <laughs> as of today, um, we added government. Okay, so that timeline had changed. Mm -hmm. And then on the 20th, um, funeral memorial services and retail will open. So that'll be the next. Um, and then probably one of the biggest ones people are anticipating is on the 22nd when restaurants come back at 33% capacity. Now that being said, they can have unlimited outdoor seating. So I hope our restaurants have prepared to be a little bit creative on how they serve folks. Um, and then on the 22nd, the groups of 10 or fewer. So um, is that something that the health department will still have to, not police, but investigate if, if claims are made that people aren't following those directions? We do still have the environmental enforcement line in place. And that number is 270-982-2000. We still have that ready. Um, if you see a business that's not following the guidelines, that's the number you can call locally. Has the district health department also been involved with some of these organizations and businesses and things that have opened to give, give them guidance in any way? It kind of depends on the business. Um, for some of them, they had to consult with us, like the graduations. Mm -hmm. It was a pass down by KDE that come up with your plan, submit it to the health department, um, and then they will give the yes or no. Sometimes we do not have a hand in that, but we can submit questions to the state and say, how should we handle this? Okay. With the, the things that have initially rolled out already, uh -huh. um, what, what do you think that the, the procedure, is everyone following the policy pretty well? You mentioned factories, you know, did they set up, have you all been involved with any of that? And uh, not with the factories per se. Um, we ha it's so new right now. Mm -hmm. Not much has opened that um, we haven't got a lot of, hey, are we doing it right? Or, hey, this person's not doing it right. I think this week and next week are really going to tell, um, especially on the enforcement side, people saying, hey, are they allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had noticed that as I was out and about this weekend that I was probably seeing about a 50% average of individuals wearing masks mm -hmm. when they're in, in, inside facilities. So is that something that, I guess from an opinion point of view, me personally, I think it probably needs to be increased. Well, that is one of the uh, minimum requirements, and we can go over those if you want to. So let's talk about this. Um, for businesses to reopen when they get to that stage, there are some minimum requirements. Um, one of them, if you have people who are using telework, let them continue to do that. You know, the fewer people in the building, the better. Um, another one is a phased return, and we're doing that ourselves. Some of our medically fragile staff are just now coming back um, because everybody in the building is masked. So, you know, it's healthier for them to be there now. Um, and social distancing, you know, that hasn't gone away. So not only do I have to worry about that with customers, but with my staff as well. So something we did is we physically taped off six feet from every desk. So you know you're not um, too close to the next person. And kind of going hand in hand with that is limiting the face-to-face -face interaction. Some businesses have already put up the plexiglass dividers, they've taped off spots. So if you are one that hasn't opened yet, you need to be thinking through those things. 
Um, and then what you mentioned, the masks and other PPE. If all of your staff needs to be masked, have you already figured out how you're going to make that happen? Are you going to provide that to your staff? Do they have to provide their own? Um, do customers, when they come into your facility, have to be masked? So businesses really should have already thought through all these pieces before they ever thought about opening their doors. Um, hand washing and hand sanitizer. We've literally gone through and made touchless soap and hand sanitizer stations, so nobody's having to touch the same hand sanitizer pump or soap pump. So, you know, have you thought about that? Does everybody have to touch that paper towel dispenser, or is that touchless? So, um, common areas. Waiting rooms are a thing of the past for a while. Um, staff break rooms may have had to be closed. So any place where there would be a gathering of people, you've got to rethink those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, sanitation, I think people were doing pretty good with that anyway, thinking about all the areas that need to be sanitized. Um, so I think that's in people's minds. Um, health checks. You know, when I came in the building, I had to have my temperature taken. So have people thought that through? When your employees get there for the day, do you have a temperature log? Do you have health screening questions? Are you going to do that with customers? So there's a lot of things to think through. Um, testing. If you have an employee that's not well, where are you going to send them for testing? How are you going to handle that? Um, what is your HR policy if they get sick at work? So another thing you need to be thinking through before you ever have staff in the building. And then special accommodations. Some people may not be able to wear a traditional mask. Some people may not be able to wear a mask at all. How are you going to handle those staff? And then um, something that's not been put out every day with the governor's Healthy at Work slides, but you really need to have a Healthy at Work designee on every, at every facility. Maybe it's your HR person. Um, but that's the person that is going to come up with your policy and make sure your policies are enforced. Mm -hmm. Um, we mentioned um, testing, mm -hmm. and testing, uh, we've had some new locations or some, you know, areas that people could go. Uh, tell us a little bit about how those operate, to your knowledge, how they function, and uh, what, what individuals should be, who, which individuals should be tested. Well, let me clear up something in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We have never provided testing. And there was a misconception out there that some of these drive through sites were sponsored by the health department. And that's not true. Um, actually, we haven't had any peace in some of the, the Kroger, the Walmart, those types of sites. Um, and really the site, um, whoever the agency is providing that testing, they set the testing criteria. Some of them, you have to be a healthcare worker or a first responder or you have to be experiencing symptoms. Um, some of them are available for anybody. So you really need to contact whoever's doing the testing to see what their criteria are. Because a lot of them have online registration. You can't just show up that day and expect to get tested. And there's probably some scams still going on, too. Um, that keeps going around. Um, if somebody's asking you to pay cash money to be tested, don't do it. That's not legitimate. Um, there should not be any out-of-pocket cost to be COVID-19 tested. And Earlier, um, a few months ago, uh, we also talked about the idea, if you work in one area but live in another, mm -hmm. where do those numbers go? If you work in Jefferson County but you live in Hardin County, do they, does that number fall in Jefferson County ranks or our ranks? It's going to be where you reside. So that's why there's been a couple of cases. We have some cities that are on the border of counties. Um, Vine Grove comes to mind. Some of them are Meade County addresses. Some of them are Hardin County addresses. So there have been a couple of situations where it took a little more investigation to figure out which county that person resided in. So it's always going to be where they reside. Is the testing getting better? The, the, the number of tests? The number of tests, but also the test itself, because there were some discrepancies with the earlier test in returns of false positive, that type of thing? I, I think the tests are good. They're still a little bit up in the air about the antibody test, whether they're valid or not. Um, they haven't been approved by the FDA, although some physicians are using them. 
So I think for now I would be hesitant about that um, at this time. And the antibodies, just explain for our audience what that means. The, the nasal swab is testing for virus. So that's to see if you have that viral load present. The antibody test is to see if you've ever been exposed to the virus. So the antibodies mean you've, you've had it, your body has worked to fight it off. Um, and like I said, we're just kind of doing a watch and see on those. Okay. Um, what about, are there any present shortages now? I mean, initially we started with playing catch up everywhere. So what right. about those shortages and, and how are we doing with PPE and masks and all those things? Well, one of the requirements for businesses to reopen is they had to have their own supply chain for PPE. So if they haven't been able to figure that out, then they should remain closed until they can. Um, there has been some push out of PPE from the state for COVID-19 response. So that's gonna be your medical, you know, your direct medical care providers. So if you're in a cosmetology business, for instance, and you need to wear gloves um, and a mask, you can't apply for those supplies. Um, but there are so many different kinds of masks out there. Um, I personally have probably six different kinds trying to find one that's comfortable to wear. So that's what I would recommend. If you're not in a healthcare position where you have to wear the N95s or you have to wear a surgical mask, play with the different types. You know, find out what's comfortable for you, what's breathable, because if it's not comfortable, you're not going to use it consistently. Now, should you uh, sanitize the mask? Uh, and let's say, say, the cloth mask, those that people are making themselves um, or that they can buy in the store that may have a, a theme to it. You know, I see a lot of uh, very, people are getting very creative. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing. You know, there's a whole new industry now exactly. for mask making. And some people are doing it charitably, too, which is awesome. Um, but, yes, they do definitely need to be washed frequently. Um, your washing machine. I discovered that putting them in the top shelf of the dishwasher actually works as well, too. It gets sanitized and it doesn't smash it mm -hmm. um, and then just let it air dry. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that even our Central Harden boys baseball team are selling masks with the Central Harden mm -hmm. colors and logo. So um, what about those individuals that are, and I guess it goes back to scams. When you see things, oh, well, I better get this one. Um, and I know the Better Business Bureau, you know, they really try to monitor that. But is that something that you're seeing more locally? Is anyone, have you all had to do any investigations into those types of things? Of people trying to sell PPE? Yeah. Um, not In terms to of my locally, knowledge. you know, of a local. Yeah, thing. not to my knowledge. I do know the Chamber has an initiative right now where they are selling masks um, at a reduced cost to businesses. So if there is a business that's having a hard time finding masks, um, I would contact the chamber. Okay. Now something in recent weeks has happened with a, a virus that's attacking children. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about that? And what exactly does that mean? It's actually very rare, um, but the, the CDC has given it a name. They're calling it the multi-symptom inflammatory syndrome. And it can lead to some life-threatening complications um, with the heart and other or major organs. Um, some of the symptoms kind of look like Kawasaki's disease. And at first they thought it was Kawasaki's disease. But some of the symptoms look like a prolonged high fever, um, a rash, conjunctivitis, which is similar to pink eye, the redness in the eye, um, vomiting, and then probably one of the ones that's uh, hit the media the most is the swollen hands and feet, um, and then red, dry, cracked lips. Um, I know they've had several cases in New York, and there was possibly two that have been investigated in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's very rare um, complication. Well, and I, I've heard discussion recently that um, even with vaccines, like we have flu vaccines, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of different types of flu. So therefore, when you get the flu shot, you're not necessarily uh, immune to all types of flu. And is that probably something that's going to be similar to what we see with COVID-19? 
Well, with flu, um, you either have trivalent, which means it has protection from three strains, mm -hmm. or quadrivalent, which you have protection from four strains. So they watch every flu season to see what they think the predominant strains are going to be. Some years they get it right on the money, and some years they don't. Um, the last two flu seasons, you know, we've had strains that weren't covered by the vaccine. Do you still get some protection? Yes, but um, not the protection you would have gotten had they gotten, you know, every single one. Now, is there so, a reason we just don't do both? I mean, always do the, the different types, or is it a financial issue? What do you mean? In terms of the vaccines, if, you know, you, it, it appears the way you're talking or what you're saying is that someone chooses which vaccine to go with every year. And that's your medical provider. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, that determines, you know, wherever you go, if they have the, the tri or the quad. So with the um, COVID vaccine, um, it's just the one strain for now. Um, so that will be what will be included in the vaccine. I'm hearing estimates of late fall but it takes a year to 18 months to develop and test a vaccine. So it could be first of the year before we have that. Right, I, I, I don't think anything, anytime you hurry up something, sometimes you enter into a, a realm that it gets dangerous down the way because you just didn't follow all proper procedures. Yeah, so there is protocols for that. Yeah. We've seen also some, uh, and I don't, I don't believe anything in, I, I'm not sure in Kentucky or not, but with meat, and poultry and pork packaging, food distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any areas in, um, any places in our serving area, your serving area that's been affected by that? No, we don't have any of those facilities um, in our service area. There are two meat processing facilities, not to the scale of like a Tyson, um, but the only, um, part we have in it is on the environmental side and they permit the retail sale of the meat. So any other inspection for those types of facilities is going to be done by the USDA. Mm -hmm. um, now if you talk about shortages because there is that scare that there's going to be a poultry shortage or um, a pork shortage um, and that's because they don't have the workers to staff the plants. Um, we don't have a, a role in that either, other than we try to meet the, the food need, you know, directing people to where are the food banks, where are the Feeding America sites, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there a reason that there are outbreaks in those facilities compared to other type of manufacturing facilities? It's just the closeness of the staff. Okay. You know, it's, it's really hard in a, a facility like that to space them out adequately. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the pushback in the beginning came from your factory settings where just the nature of how they're set up, it made it really hard for that six foot physical distancing. Right, or a ship or like a nursing home where right. everybody. Um, what about our nursing home and our um, jail facilities, prison facilities? Um, congregate settings like uh, long-term care or jails have always been a concern. Um, if you've watched the news, you know, the growing numbers in those types of settings. Um, locally, we are going to start testing residents and staff in long-term care, um, and probably the next wave will be our correctional facilities. Mm -hmm. So far, we don't have any major issues with that in your service area, no, correct? No, we do not. Okay. Um, Governor Andy Bashir is continuing to do uh, daily updates. How does that help uh, the community? And, and from your all standpoint of your role, um, I think it's a morale thing as much as anything. Um, knowing we all come together at one time, we all get the same information. Um, I, I think that's been a really good thing, that public sharing of information. Um, they have developed some really good tools. Their website is really good. Um, there's a lot of useful information there. Um, so um, that has driven kind of how we have approached our website too. You know, what are people looking for? What kind of information do they need? So, um, And with people being at home more, they have a little bit more flexibility of doing right. web surfing and, and everything. And how often do you all update your information? Every hey. day. Every day. <laughs> Literally every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's things that I haven't asked that you all are, are um, 
bombarded with every day? What are some of those topics that you'd like to just share with us that or just reiterate? Um, something people may not realize, and I'm sure this has happened with other industries as well, is some of the changes we made to respond to COVID turned out to not be negative, actually. Their processes we're probably going to hang on to because we found out they work and people like them. So, you know, if other businesses have found that out, I, I hope, you know, that they have. But something, um, our website, for instance, has been totally revamped, um, much more user-friendly, uh, much more easy to find information that you need. And a component that we're getting ready to launch is a um, teen and young adult section. Okay. You know, because they don't search for information the way you or I would. So um, we're hoping that's going to be a way to draw in the young people because they have different questions than I would at my age. Um, on the environmental side, some of our processes have gone viral. There are fees you can pay online. There are forms you can get without ever having to go into an office. And our environmental office was the first one in the state to actually conduct a virtual inspection. Oh, cool. So <laughs> kudos to them. Yeah. And then um, our support services like Hands and First Steps have all been telehealth during this time. And some components of that may last after this is over. So, you know, it was really cool. It took a pandemic to help us change our processes, but some things worked. Well, and I think that um, people do have an appreciation of some of the benefits of social media. Being able to conduct meetings across the country with other people have been really valuable. You mentioned the graduations earlier, and, and those graduations will air on our uh, channel later this week, all this weekend, and then throughout the next few weeks. And one of the common things that the parents said over and over again was, this is really nice because their child got their own personal moment. Yeah on stage, brief time to talk to individuals that they had seen or saw, and parents got to take pictures relatively close, whereas if we had had the, the large ceremonies, which we are planning to do later in the fall, mm -hmm. we'd like to bring anybody that would like to come back have the full ceremony, um, usually you don't have that availability of being only 15 feet from the stage to take pictures of and that was one of the things I heard too yeah. and it's just it was nice that 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 student got that full moment mm -hmm. and uh, um, when you're you know basically each each student probably got five to ten minutes to visit and to talk and and it was their moment across that stage and things so I think that um, the the idea of what we did was well received. I know that uh, graduates will still want that big ceremony, yeah. and we do too. But it, it did make it much more personal and things. So those are, are excellent things. Of course, if people need information, where do they go? Um, if you have questions, the state hotline is still available, and that is 1-800-722-5725. And then our website is our initials, ltdhd.org and then again the state website um, is kycovid19.ky.gov Awesome, well thank you again for joining us today Melissa and thank you all for joining us at home and we hope that you stay safe, stay healthy and think about your neighbors.